Anne Marie Slaughter, Tom Nichols, thanks so much for joining us on G Zero World. Great to be here. Thanks for having me. So I want to start with the war in Ukraine. Uh, President Volodymyr Zelensky has just been named Times Person of the Year. Uh, changed immensely how we think about the global order this war. Uh, Anne Marie, start me off with your most unsparing take on what you think this invasion means for the world. This war has simultaneously dramatically sharpened the geopolitical great power politics are back view of what is wrong in the world. Uh, and at the same time, led us to focus a lot more on the global challenges of energy shortages, climate more broadly, food security. If you think about the Biden national security strategy issued in October, they said for the first time, these two sets of challenges are equal, equally important, and both of them are dramatically sharpened by the Ukraine war. I will say, I think longer term, this war will uh, mark a high point in the willingness of, of nations to stand up for the world of the UN Charter, but it will also be a turning point in where nations get their energy and will speed us to a green transition. Tom? I don't know how the international system finally heals from the reality that one of the permanent members of the UN Security Council is a nuclear armed rogue state now. Um, this is the thing that kind of keeps me up at night, that there is no real exit for Russia, even in the medium term. Even if Putin were to leave the scene tomorrow, um, there is a reckoning here. I mean, Russia got the benefit of the doubt after 1991. After 70 years of communism, the rest of the world said bygones, you know, World War I, the Bolshevik Revolution, a lot of bad things happened. We understand, you know, now this is Russia's chance. Well, 30 years later, there, there isn't another chance. I mean, Russia is not getting the benefit of the doubt the second time around, uh, but we are stuck with all the institutions in which Russia ha is going to punch above its weight in, in every way. This is now, you know, a the one of the most powerful countries in the world, at least by you know, meg measured in megatonnage, deciding that it will um, obliterate its neighbors at will. And I, I'm i not sure. I wish I could say I, I see the long term here, but I'm not sure um, how this ends um, with the international system that we once knew intact. I think, I, I want to be optimistic and say, I think the international institutions are going to prevail, that Russia will be the part that has to change over, over time. But um, this is something that I didn't, I just didn't think I would see 30 years after the end of the Cold War. I don't agree with Tom that there's this dramatic change where suddenly one of the, the, the great powers, one of the permanent members of the, of the Security Council is a nuclear rogue state. I, I agree that that may be the way the Europeans see it more than they ever have before, maybe the Americans. That is not true of the rest of the world. I, I really think ma many, many other nations in the world are looking at this war and saying, this is a North war. This is an East-West war. It's not our war. And the biggest changes I see in the international system are all those countries. An Indian recently said to me that instead of talking about the global South, we should talk about the global majority. All those countries are demanding their place at the uh, global institutional table. And that means a lot of turbulence uh, in lots of different parts of the system. If the institutions hold, um, we will have no one to thank more than Vladimir Putin. Uh, this was, I mean, it, this is proof again that Vladimir Putin is a terrible strategist uh, because the Russians were getting what they wanted. Institutions were weakening. And suddenly, you know, 32 nations in NATO, including Finland and Sweden, the European Union actually acting like a transnational union that has a common interest. Uh, the Russians have created exactly the world they thought they were going to forestall. So R Russia is in a dramatically different position, uh, as Putin is uh, going into 2023, as he was uh, going uh, into 2022. Uh, China, of course, also is looking a little different, not, not because of the Russian war so much, but rather, I mean, yes, she has had this incredibly successful party Congress, 
Uh, but uh, China's economy is looking a lot more dicey. Um, there's a lot of uh, freezing uh, of uh, China's uh, industry that's been occurring from all this state intervention. And of course, we saw all these big demonstrations, not massive demonstrations, but still unprecedented in recent years in China. And now they are suddenly saying, oh, the virus has changed, no more zero COVID. Not going to be easy to pull off. Um, how do you think China and Xi are positioned globally as we look ahead to 2023? Start with you, Anne-Marie. I think it's going to be a rocky year for China. I really do. For one thing, the zero COVID policy fed on itself because uh, as people stayed locked down and they didn't get vaccinated and people will look back and say, why on earth didn't uh, the Chinese government with all its power simply insist on vaccinations, even with a less ex effective vaccine? But once you've done that, you've got a population, of course, of over a billion people, including many, many old people who are not vaccinated. And so now we are going to see deaths. Uh, and the question is, how how many, how fast? Uh, but that that will have its own fallout, both socially and economically for Xi. Uh, and in addition to just navigating the the overall shift in policy, it is very striking that after right after this Congress, where she is supposedly at the apex of his power, you see successful demonstrations, right? He is changing his policy. That means he thinks he can't just maintain it. It also means that notwithstanding probably the most repressive apparatus in the world, or certainly one of them, he couldn't stop these demonstrations, right? They went from city to city. There are small demonstrations that are local all the time in China. It's one of the ways, in fact, that the Chinese government lets Chinese blow off steam and figures out you know, how to adjust policy. But if you see anything like the deaths that we saw in the first four or five months of the pandemic, and it's not going to be possible to shut that information down. And at the very least, his, you know, infallible leader who is guiding China toward 2049, when it will become, you know, a, a middle income country and, and be recognized as the great power that it it has always deserved to be, that that narrative is going to be badly dented. And again, you're going to see economic fallout as well. So, Tom, how big a bump in the road? is this for China's uh, role on the global stage? What's really striking about this is how um, the Chinese regime has been revealed to be, has been cut down to size as just another government that has to deal with a bunch of problems that governments have to deal with, like a pandemic. Um, and there's even, uh, to me, again, it feels like a little bit of a Cold War echo. If only they weren't using their own less effective vaccine. And the idea that the Chinese could just clamp down on dissent and could, um, you know, continue their role as an economic superpower and maintain all of that kind of facade of invulnerability, I think has really been, and I think that's frankly a good thing that that, that 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 facade has been kind of pulled down a bit. I'm sorry for the loss of life and the loss of productivity and all the other things that have happened from the pandemic. But I think we were we were kind of convincing ourselves of a narrative that the Chinese government could do almost anything. Uh, Anne Marie, uh, the other big conversation that's happening around China right now is to what extent there is and or there should be a level of economic decoupling uh, between the West and China, both on the national security side, but also in terms of more investment at home, more focus on domestic workforces, all of these things, very different than the globalization arguments, of course, that dominated the global economic conversations for so many decades. How do you feel about this in the China context? There has been some decoupling and there will undoubtedly be more, but it, it it has to be limited. I think it will be limited simply because uh, for for whatever is happening to China and Chinese growth this year, it has still been the fastest growing economy, the 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 you know hundred pound gorilla or eight hundred pound gorilla on the glo on the global stage in the last twenty years. And so we're shifting things to Vietnam. We're shifting manufacturing back home. Some degree of that, absolutely. The pandemic showed us that we were too dependent. 
But I can't. I look around at U.S. business and global business. I look at the European Union, and the, and the, again, you're, the EU is China's greatest trading partner. We are not moving to anything remotely like not only full decoupling, even 50% decoupling. I think you're looking at 10 or 15%. That still you know, has an impact given how big the numbers are. But I think it's worth remembering China is far better governed than either Russia or Iran, right? China really has delivered a far better standard of living for its people. The Chinese government is broadly supported. There is absolutely dissent, but I think it, it is not... It, it doesn't make sense to compare it to Iran and Russia, given economic policy, social policy, even health policy, even with all, all these difficulties. Uh, so overall, China's a force. We have to continue to engage with them. And then going back to where we started on the global challenges, right? So food security, energy security, water, climate change, pandemics, if there's another pandemic and there will be, we have to work with China because without China, we we really don't have a chance of addressing these really big global threats. One more big topic. Got to get to the United States. I want to ask Tom, uh, given what we just saw from the midterms, uh, were people too overexcited about uh, how much trouble American democracy is in? Oh, no, I think we're still completely underestimating how much danger American democracy is in. Um, you know, we had a narrow escape. Um, had um, some small margins gone the other way, we would be in a world of trouble right now. I mean, do the counterfactual in your in your mind of election deniers and various other kind of kooks and weirdos taking over state offices. Because I think one problem is we still concentrate too much on the big picture of who's the president, who controls the Senate. But when you look at things like secretary of state, um, state legislative chambers, governorships, and so on, um, we we had a narrow escape, and it's not it's not done. I mean, they're all coming back for another bite of the apple uh, in 2024. So the idea that we that you know that we're somehow overestimating threat to democracy, if anything, I think we are way too complacent. So no, I I don't think democracy is out of the woods here in the United States by a long shot. Amory, well. I agree in many ways. Uh, you know, if you look at these margins, so Ralph Warnock won, you know, by 1%. These are tiny, tiny margins. And I think it's only a turning point depending, and I agree with Tom, uh, on people continuing to perceive that democracy really is at risk. At the same time, to me, probably the most important part of the midterms is not Democrat versus Republican, but Republican versus Republican. It's the rise of DeSantis against Trump uh, that is, is critical, I think, to ultimately isolating the Trump wing of the Democratic Party. And, and DeSantis is actually proving that you can pursue Trump policies, but without Trump's willingness to just trash the system completely. Long term, there's still a danger there, but for my money, it's very important to rule out the, the most extreme, the people who are willing, exactly as Tom said, to simply stand against the Constitution and to claim that their views are more important uh, than our democracy. And that's that split within the Republican Party that, that I think we will see uh, evolve in very important ways over the next two years. Now, Tom, Trump is running for the presidency, though it's hard to see it uh, in the sense that he's not actually campaigning yet. Um, do you think, what, what do you think the likelihood is, give me a percentage, that he actually can get the nomination? Oh, wow. Um, you know, if I, had to, if I had to pick right now, I'd say it's, you know, well over 60, 70 percent, simply because he will, um, because the base is with him. And this is the one place I, I and I, I agree almost entirely with everything Anne Marie just said, except for the, the way that this discussion, I think, is isolating Trump as part of the problem. The problem is that the GOP base wants these kinds of politicians. It's not just Trump. They want Kerry Lake. They want Doug Mastriano. A million and a half people in Georgia thought that Herschel Walker should be a United States senator. Somebody who would have been laughed out of the room, you know, Doug Mastriano, somebody that would have been just ruled out of bounds by a better Republican Party 10 years ago. It's not much of an improvement if DeSantis runs by basically grabbing the reins of the same base 
and and then governing in the same way, but less offensively. So final question, um, because we're, we've been picking on the GOP side here. I want to ask Anne Marie if Joe Biden comes to you right now and says, Anne Marie, do you think I should run again? What do you tell him? Right this minute, I'd say yes. You would what? I would actually say yes, because, because I think he's accomplished a lot, because he is, in fact, he was, was able, for many, many reasons, this wasn't love of Biden, but he had delivered some real legislative achievements. Now, look, his health, his, his sort of fitness, that's a matter for him and his family to decide uh, and his doctors. But but there's no sign right now that that he really can't do it. Uh, and I actually I look at this two years in uh, and I think he, he's done a lot of very important stuff. Uh, and that actually is, I think, the strongest platform to run on right now. OK, Tom, uh, Biden's your your gladiator, your Caesar. Give me the thumb. <laughs> I'm, I'm with I'm with Anne Marie on this. I'm amazed. My that this, goodness. I, I'm I'm amazed that this is even a question because if you just if you took Biden's kind of old guy, you know, ambiance out of this and said, here is the record of a first term president with all of these legislative achievements holding NATO together during a major European land war, um, you know, escorting the economy out of the doldrums. Looks like we're starting to tame inflation. On and on and on, and and a first-term president with his party in the majority not only completely limits the gains in the House, but actually gains seats in the Senate. There would be nobody saying, you know, what that guy had to do. He needs to step down. No one would yeah, say yeah. that. It's purely a matter of because he's old. And yet Donald Trump is within a few years of Joe Biden's age. Just a Joe. We're so used to Joe Biden back in his day being that, you know sort of parody of himself that now, you know, he's a, he's a 79 year old guy and everybody says, yeah, he's lost the step. Now, you know, the problem we have, Tom, is that the older you get, the younger those people look to you. <laughs> <laughs> that is true. Tom Nichols, Anne Marie Slaughter, always great to see you. Glad to bring you together on television for the first time. It was great, it was great. fun. Thank you.